to start addressing Pentecost today and talk about this promise. And some of you might be saying, so why aren't we preaching like a graduation service message out of this? And I had every intention to until I started to die. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, kids, you can go. Have fun. <laughs> Thanks, Mom, for the reminder. I was just going to bunch into it. So... As I was looking into this, as we were going through the last couple of weeks, I had every intention of just creating two different services with two different messages. But as I started to study, I really realized that if we want uh, our graduates and our kids to really experience life as God intended, this is the message for them today, even though it's the same one that we preached in first service today, because it's talking about this amazing promise that we have. So today we're going to be going to the book of Acts, chapter 2. We're going to be primarily looking at verses 1 through 13, but we're going to look at some of chapter 1, uh, going into chapters 3 and 4 a little bit to just see some things that God has there. The scriptures will come up on the screen in front of you, but if you have a Bible, I encourage you to open it up and to really dive into what God has for us today because it is an amazing thing that Jesus has done for us. So it was about a month ago, maybe a little more, a little less, that I was sitting at home one evening inside the living room, and my son came to me with his iPad in hand. And if, when he comes to me around 8 o'clock with his iPad in hand, that is never a good thing, because usually it means he wants dad to buy something. All right, have you ever had that where your kid is coming up and asking you uh, <laughs> for something? He was carrying his iPad in hand because he had just finished searching, and Nathan has been into this forever. Have you ever heard of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, right? They've been around, for, they've been around since I was a kid, and, and so I'm trying to understand why he has such an affinity for them, but he does, and he collects a lot of the toys, and as he was going through the inter that, internet that night, he found, believe it or not, a new one that he wanted. And so as he's dragging his iPad to me and says, Dad, I want to show you something. <laughs> yeah, we all know what that means, right? And so he's showing it to me. And I'm like, are you asking me to buy this for you? He says, no, I have my own money. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Cash in hand, right? <laughs> and so he brought his money down. And we placed the order for this toy. And he was so excited. And I was excited for him that he saved up money to buy something that he wanted. But one of the problems with this is that we did not buy this on Amazon, which has your guaranteed, you know, your prime shipping and you get everything really quickly. This came on eBay, where he had to wait a little while. And if I've learned anything, even from our congregation here, even from a certain someone who works very closely with me in the office, who likes to try to finagle the shipping systems around here to get things a little bit quicker, it's hard for us sometimes to wait when we know that something exciting is coming. Would you agree with that or not? Absolutely it is. And this little boy had to wait for shipping because they only gave us an estimate. And so for the next few days, this is kind of what it looked like at our house. <laughs> right? He would get home from school, and the first question as I would pick him up from the elementary school was, Dad, did it come yet? No, buddy, we only ordered it last night at 8 o'clock. It is not here yet. And he's like, okay, well, you tell me when it is here, and I'm, I'm going to be looking for it. And this daily excitement would just keep going. He was filled with an anticipation that could not be quenched. He would check for it. He would look at the email to see if there was an update about it. He wanted to see the shipping updates. He would check and see if his promised package had arrived. And this went on for a week. And that excitement just built inside of him. And you could just see that every day he would come home and it's just like, oh, it's not here. But guess what? One day, it showed up. Hmm. His excitement was palpable. He went and grabbed his pocket knife and he opened up the box and then we went and tried to open up that toy. And if you're a parent of a child right now, you realize there is no greater puzzle than trying to open up a toy for a kid anymore. It is so stuck in there and you have to clip it out with scissors. It's like doing surgery, right? And so he goes through and we're doing those things. And he is so excited. He just played with that toy constantly. It's actually in the stack of toys that he was playing with last night, I believe. He was so excited. He didn't let it out of his sight because the thing that was promised had arrived. What is it like for you to wait for something that was promised to you? Are you good at waiting? What do you think? Yes or no? Are you good at waiting? 
Some people were, most people, the loud people were no, but I think some people are and some people aren't, right? But waiting sometimes can be hard, especially when you know it's coming. It's like you're just watching paint dry for it to come. But sometimes we're sitting there with a hopeful expectation where we know it's coming. It could be here at any minute. And we're wondering and having the questions in our mind, when will it arrive? We're waiting with this bated breath, with this expectant nature. And I got to tell you, in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, it is just the same thing as the disciples faced after Jesus had went and ascended back to his Father in heaven. Because what we found here is that Jesus made a promise to his followers that day, those people who watched him ascend. But I got to tell you this, that promise wasn't just for the disciples in Jerusalem, but it was a promise for every believer for the rest of time. For every one of us in this room, this promise can be ours today. And it's one that will impact our lives so deeply, so profoundly, that once you've received it, your life will never, ever be the same. And the only reason it applies to us is because of Pentecost. And so I want us to unpack that today. How does this apply to us? And how does this promise, which is here, how does it impact how we live the life of faith? as we go forward. So let's pray as we begin to unpack this today. Jesus, we thank you so much for calling us into your presence today. Not one of us in this room is here by accident today. We're here because you anointed this time as special. You've ordained for us to be here to hear your message. And I pray, Jesus, that we would respond in such a powerful way to you today. Lord, mold and shape our hearts and our minds. Implant this word deeply inside of us so that it will grow and take root. Because Jesus, I don't know if anybody else has the same cry as me, but I imagine they do. Lord, I just want more of you in every aspect of who I am. And so God, I know that's a prayer that you are going to answer in the affirmative because you tell us over and over in scripture that's your desire for us too. So God, make it happen today. Show us the power of this promise that was given to us. May the words that I speak and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight today, Jesus. May you speak to us powerfully. We love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The book of Acts, if you've never read through the book of Acts, you need to do so. It is one of the best books of scripture that you're ever going to find. But it starts off with one of the best pictures and displays of magnificence in all of scripture. And so this magnificent scene in Acts chapter 1 actually starts 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead. And so this actually is ascension day as as 40 days afterwards. So Jesus with his disciples and 500 of their closest friends go to this mountain which most people think is kind of in the northern part of Israel in the area of Galilee, right? Kind of where they did all their message. And on this mountain This is where Jesus is going to be taken into heaven that day to go and return to his father, to be seated at the right hand of his father in heaven. And this is an amazing, amazing display here. This is where his disciples are going to watch Jesus who basically just starts to float away. He's going up and up and up. It's kind of like being at an airport. Have you ever been to an airport and watch an airplane take off? And you just keep watching it and watching it, then all of a sudden you can't see it anymore. That's what would have happened here to Jesus as he was going up into heaven. A magnificent, magnificent scene. But before he ascended, before he returned to his father, Jesus left his disciples with a command that day that we find in Acts chapter 1 in verses 4 and 5, and he'll explain more of it in verse 8 as we're coming on here. And the command was simply this that he gave to his disciples. He said, I want you to stay in Jerusalem. Now, for most of you, you're sitting here thinking to yourself, so what's the big deal of that command? Jerusalem seems like a nice place, right? At this point, you could go to a store, you could buy food, you had lodging to be able to stay in. It was way better than being out in the sticks and just having to try to hunt anything. But what we find here is that this is really important 
because Jerusalem was a very hostile place for these believers that were there, right? This was only 40 days after the resurrection. The turmoil in Jerusalem was fierce. The Pharisees were still trying to eliminate anybody who was talking about Jesus. These men, they were scared stiff about this process of staying in Jerusalem so much that all the disciples, the 120 that there were, actually gathered in this upper room after Jesus had ascended. They didn't just gather there to have a church service. They gathered there for protection and to keep quiet. This was a hard command for them to keep, but this hard command came with an incredible promise. I want you to stay in Jerusalem until I send the Holy Spirit to you. Hmm. Why is that such a big deal? But I also think if I was one of the disciples, I would have been asking this question. Why are you making us wait for it? Why not just give it to us now? How long are we going to have to wait? What are we actually looking for? What's it going to look like when he comes? Um, how will we know that it's actually him? What is this going to do for us? These questions oftentimes just go over and over and over in their minds. And I think they go over and over and over in our minds too. God, when are you going to show up and do this? You've promised this. When is it going to take place? What's it going to look like? What am I supposed to be looking for? How will I know? When is it going to happen? Well, frankly, these disciples didn't have to wait long. Jesus ascended 40 days after the resurrection. By the way, did you realize that I was just talking with Jose and Melanie last week, and they said that their kids were off of school that day. They had a national holiday in, in Germany, and I don't know if you've ever heard of it. They had off of school for Ascension Day. They take off of school, these, these areas out there that we're sending international workers to, took off of school because they're celebrating the day that Jesus went back to his father. What holiday in the Jewish calendar is only 10 days later? It's the holiday of Pentecost. These disciples only had to wait 10 days. And as they were in that upper room together, they were praying, they were fasting, they were seeking the presence of God. It was here that they actually cast lots to select Judas's replacement. Who was Judas's replacement disciple? Does anybody know what his name is? Matthias, thank you, yeah. How many of you knew that? Yeah, some of us did, some of us didn't, right? This is what they were doing there. They were getting everything set up because they were waiting to be released. And they didn't have to wait long. The celebration of Pentecost is actually one of the three festivals that Jewish people are commanded to keep. Pentecost actually is a Greek word. Does anybody know the feast that they're talking about here for the Greek word? Feast of weeks, right? So seven weeks after the Passover, they were commanded all, it was one of the three feasts that everybody was supposed to descend on Jerusalem for. And they came out on this time to, to celebrate. Jews from all over the world were supposed to come to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast there, seven weeks after Passover. And honestly, they were celebrating this because it was at the conclusion of the harvest, but another part of the Feast of Weeks that the commentators were talking about was that this was a feast that they really celebrated the giving of the law from Moses. And so they would have had all this aspect of God's presence being in the burning bush from Exodus chapter 3. I found that fascinating. But only 10 days after Jesus' ascension, the promise that birthed the church and empowers believers came. By the way, yeah, like I said earlier, happy birthday. I, we should actually, somebody go tell Lori to scrape off one of the kids' names and say happy birthday church on a graduation cake over there because it is our birthday today. 1,997. Happy birthday. Did you ever think you would make it that far? <laughs> All right. That, that's what happened here. Jesus birthed the church. He empowered the believers because the Holy Spirit came that day. What did it look like? What was actually the experience that these disciples had? I think what you're going to see when we read this passage is you're going to see something that is so powerful that is meant to be empowering for us today. So starting in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says this. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together together 
in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Time out. What does a tongue of fire look like? What is a tongue of fire? It actually kind of looks like this. It's where one of those flames actually goes really long. It looks like kind of like the tongue of a lizard when they're going to go and eat up a fly that's out there. That's what a tongue looks like. Why fire? Why fire? Fire purifies. Huh? Protection? Mm Mm-hmm. Huh? Brings warmth. Yeah, fire is the power and presence of God. I find it fascinating to hear is that they're sitting there celebrating a feast where they're talking about the burning bush. Why is the burning bush so important in the story of Moses from Exodus 3? Because that burning bush that didn't burn up the bush signified that God's presence was there and Moses was commanded to take off his shoes for he was standing on holy ground. All of a sudden now the presence of God, the Shekinah glory is present over the disciples here. God rested on them. That's why the wind is there as well. What a powerful display that they would not have missed. They all would have known what that meant. Is that God's presence now resides in his church. Right? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, right? Because the Feast of Weeks was happening. They all had to show up here. They all spoke different languages. Could they all speak Hebrew? Yeah, because they were going to go in and worship. But all these Jews were speaking different languages to set the stage. In verse 6, it says this, And at this sound, The multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And so the timeout is this, is that Galileans were considered to really be the dumb people. Okay, the uneducated, they wouldn't know how to speak their own language, let alone know how to speak Spanish or Latin or the language of the Cretans, as we're going to see in a moment. They're saying, this must be an act of God because I know there is no natural way that these people would all be able to speak all of these different languages. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Perga and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to, to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, and this really would refer to the Pharisees who were kind of there watching as well, and were mocking them, said they are filled with new wine. Why did they say new wine? Because it was easier to get drunk on new sweet wine. They must have tippled a little too much in the old festivals here that this is why they're out here speaking with such joy. They were trying to discredit them. If you haven't read it, go on and read verses 14 through 41 at some point today because you're going to see Peter respond to this, an amazing sermon that still gives me chills. But friends, this is Pentecost. What an amazing, amazing story that it is. Actually, Matthew Henry, in his commentary, made the note that this was such a wonderful remembrance. Do we, I think in our churches today, we take it for granted Why do we worship on Sunday mornings? Does anybody know? What's the reason why we do church on Sundays instead of Saturdays or Wednesday? Jesus rose from the dead, and what else? The Holy Spirit came. And Matthew Henry brought us to both of those points of saying what a wonderful remembrance that both Easter and Pentecost happen on a Sunday. That's why the church gathers on Sundays. Because this is God's presence with us. And so the question 
that we need to unpack for us today is what does the promise of Pentecost bring to a believer? Why is this important? Why do we need to highlight this? And I think there's two things that we want to get into and unpack with this today. Is the first one is this, is that the promise of Jesus that he made to us as believers is that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what verse 4 actually says. He says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in the tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so I want to make sure that we kind of take a time out moment. And I think there's two really big terms that we want to make sure that we uh, cover here so that there's no confusion on what this is. I want to contrast what does it mean to be baptized with the Spirit and what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because I think those things are important. And so where we come from as as CMA churches is we believe this, is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a single event at salvation where God actually takes a believer, seals them as his own, and brings them and places them inside of the church. Basically saying, this person is now a believer. The Spirit's going to come on as a guarantee of inheritance, a sign that they're mine, and I'm plucking them from being sons of Adam who are under the control of slavery and bondage to bringing them over here to the church, and I'm placing them there. They're mine. And it only has to happen once. Okay, where do we find this at? I think it's really important to read 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Because this is where we find that type of language come that supports it. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. All and all who were made to drink of the one spirit, right? It's this unifying factor, mark of identification. Actually, even in Acts chapter 11, verses 15 through 16, uh, as Peter is talking here, he was talking to some new believers who were saying, just like before, referring to Pentecost, we've been baptized and identified in this way. That's how we would define that. But I think there's one that oftentimes we ignore and it is such a powerful one. His friends, I want us to talk about what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit. And to be filled with the Spirit is a daily thing where we are yielding and submitting to the control and the working and the residence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Ephesians 5.18, one of the things that I like to tell people is this is not a passage about alcohol. Okay? Okay? By the way, should you get drunk? No, that's a sin. Don't do that, right? But why? Ephesians 5.18 says this, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And this word filled here connotes controlled, where we yield the aspects of our life to his control, to his residency. Whereas we find, like in Galatians chapter 2.20, that we are denying ourselves, that we want the old Adam to be crucified and died over here, so that the new Adam, which is submitting to the power of the Holy Spirit, can live a life of effective service to God through his enablement, through his control, through his gifting. I can't live this on my own. The Holy Spirit has to come in to control me, to empower me, to to encourage me, to guide me, to give me utterance. He needs to be the one who is in charge. And I absolutely think that that is crucial and vital to us as believers, that we be filled, that we operate in the power of the Holy Spirit because life of faith cannot be done without it. That we trust the Spirit for guidance, enablements, That's what Ephesians, uh, the Acts 2 was talking about. Is that those people there who were speaking those different languages, ministering to God, it was not in their capability. They were doing it because of the power of the Spirit in their life. And that's what we see coming in verses 5 through 13. Is that when the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, it leads to an empowered life. And look what they were able to do. What do we see in this story from Pentecost? The first thing, man, there was some amazing courage being displayed by the disciples. But it wasn't natural. They were locked away. 
They were out of sight in that upper room, fearing the Jewish leaders. But once they were filled with the Spirit, once they received that anointing, man, they had the courage to leave that room to speak truth in the face of danger. They were preaching messages. They were declaring the glory of God in all of these different languages. Man, I couldn't believe the power that you're seeing there. If you look into the second half of Acts chapter 2 and Peter's sermon, I got to ask this question myself. On Good Friday, you get a picture of Peter as he was sitting around basically that campfire that out there when a kid came and asked him if he knew Jesus what was Peter's response even to a child no I don't know him how do you get Peter in this passage now to be able to preach a sermon where 3,000 men come to faith in one day and by the way when we say 3,000 men that means like six to 7,000 people because they didn't count women and children at that time that was only through the anointing of the Holy Spirit to make that happen it was divine empowerment that Peter was there with it Peter and John lived out this life where they went the very next within those next couple days and as they were going back to the temple after Pentecost they met a crippled guy who is sitting there on the way to the temple and says, do you have any money for me? And as any good minister, no, they didn't have any money for them, but what I do have for you, I give it freely. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And that guy never walked a day in his life. How long does it take a baby to learn how to walk? Usually a long time, because uh, first they're going to go like this, and then they're going to fall. This dude never walked a day in his life and got up and walked away and picked up his mat and went with him. It was because of the power of the Spirit in Peter and John that allowed that to happen. Hmm. That is fantastic to think about it. Hmm. They were able to live out their faith. Matthew Henry writes this up in there. I think we need to hear this. Is that the Spirit, like fire, melts the heart. This is what Lane was talking about earlier. Melts the heart. Burns up the dross. What does the dross mean? It means all the junk that is left over after it was purified. Burns up the dross and kindles pious and devout affections in the soul. This is that fire which Christ came to send upon the earth. This is Pentecost. And we see that through the Holy Spirit, he gives us the power for holy living where we can trust him because he's the one who now lives in us for our ministry capacity. We can serve in the gifts and the talents that God actually gives to us through the power of the Spirit Hmm. to testify for him. Sometimes in languages or words that we just don't even know where they came from, outside of our natural ability, all leading from spots of divine intimacy. I don't know if my dad remembers this, but I remember this story very vividly. That I was like in fifth or sixth grade, and we were sitting, our spot in church was right kind of where Rod and Erica are sitting now. Nobody sat in our pew. The day huts were kind of behind us, and we were ushered. Dad and some other people were ushering that day, and they had a sign-up sheet out back that it was asking for usher volunteers. Wouldn't you know my father had the audacity to sign my name to that list? (laughs) Doggone it. And I remember saying it point blank, I will not go in front and stand in front of people. I hate being in front of people. I wanted to be left alone. Toot toot to you too. I got to tell you, there is absolutely no way that I could ever stand up here in my own strength and find any joy from it. But it's because I've submitted to the Holy Spirit's leading in my life. And I can guarantee the areas of ministry that God has called you to live in. Maybe it's living out your faith with friends or neighbors and your coworkers, uh, students at school. You cannot live out the life of faith without the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. You can't do it. You can't do it without him giving you that divine enablement. Hmm. By the way, I find it incredibly fascinating today. Why isn't there a temple in Jerusalem anymore? Is it just that they were too lazy to rebuild it over 2,000 years? We're the temple. 
We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He resides in us so that we are going with him constantly. When Jesus was going back to heaven and he ascended, you can almost guarantee that the first thought inside the, uh, the apostle's mind there is, why is Jesus leaving us? And the answer is, he isn't. The Spirit is right here. And by the way, for those of you who are concerned, the Holy Spirit is God. He is not his breath. He is not some utterance. The Holy Spirit is God. And we need to live and operate with him. So what is the point of all this for us as believers? What is the point for the two graduates today? And really, it's this, that the only way to live an effective life is through the filling of the Holy Spirit. If you ever come to a spot where you think your life is lacking that point or direction or that joy, that's the question you need to ask. Do I need a fresh filling from the Holy Spirit? The founder of the CMA, uh, Dr. A.B. Simpson, wrote this back in the 1800s. Now, I understand that you're probably not going to be able to read that. I will read it for you, where he actually prays this, and it's entitled, More, Lord. It says, God is calling us to enlargement. He is bringing us out of the narrow channels and shallow currents into a place of broad rivers and streams where we shall get out of our littleness, our constricted self-life, our narrow thoughts, views, aims, joys, ambitions, and affections, and rise to the length and breadth and height and depth of all the fullness of God. We need a larger baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are capacities in the human spirit none of us has ever yet begun to realize. New baptisms awaken the dormant powers that we did not know we possess. Friends, the Spirit of God wants to do so much more in us that I think that we just simply don't allow it to happen. I think for a lot of us, the Holy Spirit is often confusing or misunderstood. Uh, don't be afraid of him. It doesn't mean that you're going to turn into this wacko person out there that does crazy things. Now I'm going to switch that because being a craft pastor is a crazy thing. Why would you do it? It is the most unsettling job that you can have. If you think babysitting 20 kids is a lot, try 300. I said there's no such thing as job security in it. Why would you do it? It's because the Holy Spirit of God said to. And when he places that type of calling and you ask for more and more, you're going to be so excited to see what God is doing in our lives. Don't devalue the role of the Holy Spirit. It is good to desire more of him. And so, friends, I want you to think of this, that as we're going through our daily lives and our workplaces and our families, I'll yield to his working in every corner of our lives. Friends, I'm going to tell you this. I think we need to yield to the power and filling of the Spirit in order to love our spouse as well, or as God has intended. We need to yield to the power of the Holy Spirit and how we raise our kids and pray for them. We need to yield to the power of the Spirit and how we honor our parents, how we serve in ministry. Yield to the power of the Spirit so that you're operating in His giftedness it, with the talents that He gives to us, with His empowerment. The Holy Spirit can do so much more than we ever ask or imagine. Friends, do we ask Him to? Yield to him in how you do your job, how you play, how you make your priorities in life. Yield to the power of the Spirit in your joys. Friends, yield to the power of the Spirit and the filling of your Spirit, even in pain and struggle. Huh. I don't have it in me to preach today. This has been a hard week. But you know what? The Spirit of God is what fills us to do it. We've all been there. Friends, the promise is here. The Spirit of God is here. Do you want to be filled with Him? Do you want to trust Him? Do you want to walk with Him? Will you be filled? Let's pray together.
Father, we thank you so much. I thank you for the joy and the passion that as I look at these pages and even into Peter's sermon, even how the church lives together as a life of faith in verses 42 and 47, all those things are inspired by the filling of the Holy Spirit inside of us that, that empowers us, that presses us into your presence. And yet, Jesus, I am so aware that while we can see it from these pages, some, there's got to be the question in here today of saying, so how do I even be filled? And Lord, I am so thankful that all it is is simply coming before you with our hearts and arms outstretched as saying, Holy Spirit, fill me, come. I give up control. Fill my heart, fill my mind. Fill me from my shoes to my head so that I may live and act with you. God, may that be true of the people in this room today, that we would have this desire, that it would impact our conversations, that it would impact how we love one another, that it would impact our service and our testimony in some very powerful ways. Jesus, fill us with your spirit today. God, that's the way to live a joyous life. We love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. So I'm going to dismiss this in a moment. The dinner is going to be happening. I'm going to pray for it now like I would normally do at a service like this so that when you go out